Jewish channels we can review. Obama, Netanyahu, and Abbas at the United Nations breaking down what they had to say, the most ancient evidence for the existence of King David, hitting it big on Broadway, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. Israel is again being tossed in many directions amid the latest developments in the Middle East and the United Nations. As we've been discussing here on the Jewish Channel for many months, Israel is likely to be caught up in the dual problem of Iran, which on the one hand has a nuclear program that the United States and other powers would like to stall, and on the other hand both funds certain terrorist groups like Hamas and Hezbollah and is seen as a potential ally to the United States in fighting terrorist groups like ISIS. For several months, Iran has been able to push back deadlines on negotiations over reducing its nuclear program and has been able to avoid blowback on missing key deadlines and potentially furthering its nuclear program rather than reducing it. At the same time, Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas, who has been facing a significant dip in popularity, delivered a bold speech at the United Nations accusing Israel of, quote, genocidal activity. Abbas is facing internal dissent after the Gaza war that both saw Hamas fighting Israel and approximately 2,000 and Palestinians die, and then faced further criticism for his diplomatic approach to resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict when the Israeli government announced the annexation of a thousand acres of the West Bank shortly thereafter. Abbas's speech was quickly criticized by the United States for its claims of genocidal activity on the part of Israel. President Abbas's speech today included offensive characterizations that were deeply disappointing and which we reject, said a State Department spokesperson. Such provocative statements are counterproductive and undermine efforts to create a positive atmosphere and restore trust between the parties. Of course, using words like genocidal is just rhetoric, even if it is a major difference from just a year ago when Abbas said, quote, I am confident that the Israeli people want peace. This year, Abbas said no such thing, and indeed only at one point suggested anyone in Israel wanted peace when he highlighted specifically, quote, peace activists from Israel. But on the actual policy Abbas was advocating, Abbas discussed a five-point plan toward a two-state solution that included Palestinians renouncing violence, a readiness to immediately resume peace negotiations based on the same terms they've been launched with in recent years, and specifically said, quote, our efforts are not aimed at isolating Israel or delegitimizing it. President Barack Obama, for his part, had a very different approach from last year's speech at the United Nations. In 2013, Obama said, quote, In the near term, America's diplomatic efforts will focus on two particular issues, Iran's pursuit of nuclear weapons and the Arab-Israeli conflict. The president has changed his tone on both issues quite a lot from a year ago. In 2013, Obama spoke of negotiations with Iran over seven paragraphs, mentioning Iran or Iranians 20 times. With the deal that resulted after that speech, perhaps now in tatters, Obama still struck a diplomatic tone, but did not express hope or optimism about a deal and mentioned Iran only briefly, a total of three times in 78 words for a single short paragraph. And on the issue of Israeli-Palestinian peace, again, Obama downgraded his discussion of the issue from five paragraphs in 2013 to just one paragraph last week. Here's that one paragraph in full. Leadership will be necessary to address the conflict between Palestinians and Israelis. As bleak as the landscape appears, America will not give up on the pursuit of peace. Understand, the situation in Iraq and Syria and Libya should cure anybody of the illusion that the Arab-Israeli conflict is the main source of problems in the region. For far too long, that's been used as an excuse to distract people from problems at home. The violence engulfing the region today has made too many Israelis ready to abandon the hard work of peace. And that's something worthy of reflection within Israel. Because let's be clear, the status quo in the West Bank and Gaza is not sustainable. We cannot afford to turn away from this effort. Not when rockets are fired at innocent Israelis or the lives of so many Palestinian children are taken from us in Gaza. So long as I am president, we will stand up for the principle that Israelis, Palestinians, the region, and the world will be more just and more safe with two states living side by side in peace and security. 
Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu did not attempt to thread the needle between the various warring and cooperating alliances in the region. Instead, Netanyahu attempted to wind all conflicts with Islamic terrorism together. So when it comes to their ultimate goals, Hamas is ISIS and ISIS is Hamas. And what they share in common, all militant Islamists share in common. Boko Haram in Nigeria, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Al-Nusra in Syria, the Mahdi army in Iraq, and the Al-Qaeda branches in Yemen, Libya, the Philippines, India, and elsewhere. Netanyahu went on to compare militant Islam to Nazism and then wind Iran into the equation too. Ladies and gentlemen, militant Islam's ambition to dominate the world seems mad. But so too did the global ambitions of another fanatic ideology that swept into power eight decades ago. The Nazis believed in a master race. The militant Islamists believe in a master faith. They just disagree who among them will be the master of the master faith. That's what they truly disagree about. And therefore, the question before us is whether militant Islam will have the power to realize its unbridled ambitions. There is one place where that could soon happen. The Islamic State of Iran. For 35 years, Iran has relentlessly pursued the global mission which was set forth by its founding ruler, Ayatollah Khomeini, in these words. We will export our revolution to the entire world until the cry there is no God but Allah will echo throughout the world over. And ever since, the regime's brutal enforcers, Iran's revolutionary guards, have done exactly that. Moving on, all this war and conflict could leave you nostalgic for a different era. Well, one part of the Jewish past that's often been looked upon with fondness is the reign of King David. One of the rare pieces of archaeological evidence that David may have in fact existed is on display in a new exhibit, as Christian Eden reports. These ancient letters tell of a great king of Israel, yet they are not from the Bible, and they do not speak of triumph, but of defeat. The Stella of Tel Dan boasts of the end of the House of David at the hand of the Aramaeans, and it is one of 260 ancient artifacts and works from the lands of the Bible and beyond, currently on display through January 4th at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The new exhibition, Assyria to Iberia, at the dawn of the Classical Age, focuses on the cultural exchange between the Middle East and Western Europe in the first millennium. The massive show is drawn from 41 museums in 14 countries and organized by curator Joan Aruz from the Metz Department of Near Eastern Art. She gave the Jewish Channel a tour of a portion focusing on the lands of Israel and the tumultuous era its peoples lived through. This is a time when there was a break in civilization in the Eastern Mediterranean and Western Asia, a time when the palaces, the big palatial societies of the Aegean world and the Near East all collapsed and were destroyed. We're not quite sure how this happened, but the result of it was uh, displacement, uh, decentralization, and new peoples that entered the Near East. Among them, the Peleset, who are one of the so-called peoples of the sea, and we know of the Peleset as the Philistines. And while most people today know the Philistines from the loss of their champion Goliath to a young David, it is the eventual defeat of David's house which informs this room's most important object for biblical scholars, a stone inscribed in Aramaic discovered at Tel Dan in northern Israel. And what's so extraordinary about it, um, as you can see in the area that has been picked out in white, is that it says House of David. It's the only mention of King David outside the Bible. Now this is written in Aramaic. This was a monument put up by a king of Damascus in Syria. And 
we think it's Hazael, a famous uh, Syrian ruler who we know as a destroyer of many Philistine cities as well as the House of David. Another relic with a story tells of a Syrian king, Sennacherib, who attacked Judah and Jerusalem in 701 BCE. This is a prism of Sennacherib, so it's uh, part of uh, his annals. It tells the history of his early campaigns, uh, one of which was to um, conquer the cities of Judah. Now, we know that he, uh, he conquered Lachish, which was the, one of the big cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem. However, the Bible tells us that Sennacherib was unsuccessful in conquering Jerusalem. He never destroyed Jerusalem. To see more relics from the era of King David currently on display at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, please tune into the full broadcast edition of the Week in Review. Thank you, Christian. David was known for his music before he was known for his kingship. And one young Jewish actor is pushing forward in a new musical from Sting. Meredith Gansman reports in a segment from the latest episode of TJC's theater show, Road J. Starring in The Last Ship, a new musical by Sting, Aaron Lazar travels in British style. The Last Ship is about a guy named Gideon who grows up in this town called Wall's End in England. And that's a town where Sting grew up. And it's a big shipping town, at least it was, until the industry died. So the show is about Gideon coming home after 15 years to this town that's dying because its industry is dying. How I come into play is he is still in love with the girl that he left behind, and she's now in a relationship with me. You'll have to come see the show and then find out how that love triangle works out and what happens with the building of a huge ship. Lazar works up an appetite on stage, and what's more fitting for a nosh than some classic British fish and chips? We are going to let Chef Matt Arnfield at a salt and battery in Manhattan's West Village take a break. And we're going to take over making fish and chips. Two Jews, right. three fryers. What could go wrong? You chips you have an apron. You're fine. Working alongside rock star Sting, however, is going much better. I got to spend time with him and our music director, Rob Mathis, in a room where Sting would just play the guitar and be like, Aaron, I wrote you a song. Would you like to hear it? Like, uh, yes. Back in the kitchen, Matt shows us how to make proper fish and chips. So, pop them in the pilot. You know, my, uh, this is my mother's side of the family, maiden name is Pollock. Not my mom, but my uh, mom's mom. This is in honor of my, uh, my Zeta and my Bubby Pollock. Great, go try it. It would be great. The Zeta special, that's huge. That's that's perfect like yeah. that. Okay. Beautiful. And then dig in. Thank you, Matt. No problem. Thank Enjoy. You. We awesome. work for our fish. Right? Cheers. There you go. Hey, if Aaron and I need a gig, mm -hmm. here? Yeah, we'll we'll go good. But Lazar is pretty confident in his gig at the last ship with Sting at the helm. If this score is an example of any uh, secret desires that he's had throughout his career prior to the last five years for writing musicals, then he's going to write more because this is just fantastic. For more from The Last Ship, tune into the full broadcast version of The Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. Finally, how and what we eat has become a question and a crisis in America. This week on Up Close, we'll look at some unexpected effects of the obesity epidemic and then a theory that claims we've long had it all wrong on the idea that eating fat is what is making us fat. The obesity epidemic is having all manner of knock-on effects in our society. The transformation of our nation's waistlines is transforming our culture in many ways. Examining how the most basic cultural element of relationships is altered by this dynamic is Kaiser Health News reporter Sarah Varney, author of XL Love, How the Obesity Crisis is Complicating America's Love Life. But when we think of why obesity is happening, it could well be that we're looking at the wrong culprits in our diets. For decades now, we've thought that reducing fat in our diets is the way to health, but Nina Teichel suggests the scientific research underlying that thought is deeply flawed in her book, The Big Fat Surprise, Why Butter, Meat, and Cheese Belong in a Healthy Diet. Here's some of the highlights from my interview with Sarah Varney. When we talk about obesity in America, we talk about health in America, it's a lot of talk about numbers, it's a lot of talk about uh, factors, a lot of talk about what changes things. Um, and, and, and it tends to overall treat 
obesity and obese, p and obese people as this object. I grew up with a morbidly obese grandmother, so I certainly watched the way the world treated her. And I was very aware that, you know, when she was gaining weight, that people would say, well, she just needs to lose weight. Well, you know, the reality was that when her son was killed in Vietnam, she started eating. So just telling somebody like that to stop eating or to start losing weight is just not going to help them. So, you know, and I also saw how it affected her own relationship with her, with my grandfather. Um, and I, as a health reporter, spent many years doing a lot of stories just like you described about diabetes, about hypertension. I remember one, one story in particular um, where I was following this 14-year-old girl who was trying to qualify for a, um, a weight loss drug trial at University um, UCSF in San Francisco. And I remember having lunch with her and her family and just thinking, how is she, how, what is her life like at school? You know, not just around bullying and discrimination, but does she, you know, does she want to date somebody? What are her first romantic and sexual experiences going to be like? So that was really the idea for the book was to sort of, you know, look at overweight and obese people and ask these questions. And there are studies that have tried to get inside the heads of not only how people who are reacting to obese people, but obese people specifically. And, and overall, it's kind of, it, it's not good. It, it, it's, it's very sad and it's very self-effacing and rejecting people who look like, right? Yeah, what I found really interesting, this is part of the reason I also wanted to go to Mississippi, was does the stigma of obesity lessen when you have more obese people? So now we have two out of three Americans who are overweight or obese. In Mississippi, you have communities where 60, 70 percent of the population in the Delta, for instance, is, is obese. Um, and what I found was that it doesn't really, uh, the, 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 sort of the, the widespread um, uh, prevalence of obesity doesn't necessarily temper the discrimination and stigma against obesity. Um, in some cases, it just sort of scales it up. So you'll go to a school in, in Mississippi, and what you'll see is um, the obese girls are just not as obese as the extremely or morbidly obese girls, but the same kinds of dynamics that we sort of think of on the playground or in the classroom um, or at the prom are still in place. And within the obesity epidemic, there's it's not simply uh, children who are raised obese and become obese teens and become obese adults. There's a lot of vacillation. There's a lot of skinny kids who end up being obese and obese kids who end up being skinny. But you talk about the idea that that really affects their mental makeup too, and, and again, in really damaging ways. Yeah, actually, psychologists will tell you that for kids who grew up obese, who remain obese as adults, which the vast majority do, um, while they still pay a psychological price, that perhaps the people who grow up as um, thinner or more normal weight when they're um, younger and then gain weight when they're in their, say, 20s, that they have a much more difficult time sort of readjusting to this new reality because they remember what it was like when the world sort of treated them as a, quote, healthy weight or normal weight person. Um, so now all of a sudden they're in their mid-20s, they're trying to date, and there's, you know, a lot of rejection. They're not getting, um, you know, responses on dating websites, those sorts of things. And it can be much more agonizing for them uh, because they're, they're not accustomed to it. You can see the full episode of Up Close on the Jewish channel on cable. You can also listen to the full audio of Up Close as a podcast available on iTunes or in your favorite podcast player. That's all for this week from all of us here at the Jewish channel. Be well. The Jewish channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 1640, Iowa Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Cox Cable Channel 1, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and on Comcast on the on-demand menu on the Jewish channel. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.